with four truths. Truth number one, all life is suffering. That's a hard one. What does that mean? Birth involves suffering, death involves suffering, sickness involves suffering, old age involves suffering, not getting what you want involves suffering, getting what you don't want involves suffering. And he says even getting what you want involves suffering because it's in time and it's going to pass away. Say you want to be the playmate of the month, you become the playmate of the month, and next month you're not the playmate of the month anymore. Lay not up treasures where moth and rust doth corrupt, was Christ's way of saying it. Problem is, if it's in time, you're going to lose it. So even getting what you want has an element. It's like riding a wave on surfing. The wave's going to end, even in endless summer. His second noble truth was the cause of suffering is craving or desire. If you didn't crave life, you wouldn't fear death. You wouldn't suffer. If you don't crave something, you can't suffer about it. Third noble truth is, if you give up craving, you end suffering. And the fourth noble truth is the eightfold path or the means of giving up craving. Giving up craving, giving up desire. And now my teacher, who was a Hindu, is saying to me, desire is a trap, desirelessness is liberation. Desirelessness is liberation. What does all that mean? What it means is extricating oneself from attachment. It means, quote, renunciation. And what does renunciation mean? To us Westerners, it means a guy like Miller Repa sitting in a cave where he's been eating green nettles and he's covered with nettle fur and he looks like a bag of bones and, and you've got to give up everything. Well, it has nothing necessarily to do with that at all. Because what is required on this trip is renunciation of attachment. Renunciation of attachment. Dropping out, not in the external sense, but in the internal sense. It doesn't matter what the external trip is. Any one of them will do. The internal process that changes. Hmm? Now, how do you do that, and what is that about? And how can I tell you how Maharaji reads my mind? Take this meditation. Remember, I read you that thing about the 17 year old Ramana Maharshi. Ramana Maharshi is, does Gyan Yoga, the yoga of the mind beating out the mind. It's like Zen. And he says, do the following. And he says, just do it relentlessly. Sit down and follow the method of vichara atma, the method of self-inquiry. Sit down, you say, who am I? And then you say, I, until you have I placed in the middle of your head, and you can hear it in there, in the middle of your head, I, 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 I. I'll just take you quickly through it. We won't do it at this moment. You say, I am not this body. And then you experience your torso as object and I as subject, I in the middle of your head. Then you say, I am not my five organs of motion. Then you experience your arms as object, your tongue as object, your legs as object, your anal sphincter as object, your genitals as object. with the eye in the middle of the head as subject. You note them all. You note your arm doing its thing. You note it. Then you say, I am not my five senses. Now, you've all been in the situation where you're in a room where a clock is ticking, and you start to read something, and you get so involved in what you're reading, you don't hear the clock tick. And then you finish reading, and suddenly the clock is ticking again. Well, that's an involuntary example. You see, the clock continued to tick, your ear continued to hear the clock tick, but you were no longer attending to your ear hearing the clock tick. So at this point, you don't turn it off, you just note your ear hearing, your eye seeing, your nose smelling, your tongue tasting, your skin feeling. 